Gut, also herzlich willkommen bei Play22 und hallo von der Playstage aus dem Jupiter in Hamburg. Ähm, ja, wir starten jetzt gleich durch mit der Speakers Corner und ich äh, werde aber jetzt auch direkt quasi ins Englische ähm, wechseln, weil unser erster Beitrag auch auf Englisch gehalten wird. Welcome to Play22 and hello from the Play Stage at Jupiter in Hamburg. I'm Heiko coordinating the Speakers Corner and that's exactly where we'll see each other in the next few days. This year Play will take place online and on location. If you are in Hamburg, you, you can also drop by the Jupiter here near to the main station in Hamburg where you can visit the great exhibition with a lot of cool couch cop games and more. Now we are about to start with the speaker's corner. The first speech, as I um, mentioned already, will be held in English by Diego Alatorre. Uh, and the title is Participatory Game Design. Okay, that's a tongue twister, sorry for that. <laughs> um, in German it's like participatives uh, game design, Spielentwicklung. One last thing, you can ask questions in two ways. Either post them in the Twitch chat channel or if you're in Play Valley, go to the Shrouded stage and talk or message our helper at the left side of it. And also you can come to the audience and can ask the questions here and I will give them at the end of the speech from Diego um, to him. So. Have fun. Now I'll hand over to Diego. Very warm welcome to you. Hola, Heiko. Hola. Muchas gracias <laughs> por la invitación. Thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it is an honor for me to be uh, part of this festival. And uh, I will take my time not to stretch it too long to keep it within the 15 minutes and so what I'm going to share with you has to do with the results of early results of my PhD. I've uh, been studying since last year in Coimbra University in Portugal. Even though I am Mexican, uh, I've been living here for the last uh, months. So uh, my talk is indeed complex. I try to make it more. So, uh, I call it participatory game design. It could also uh, be called how to make collaboration fun. Let's see if I, we manage to answer this question. Uh, it is inspired in the, the work of a lot of uh, people, but particularly I like this quote from Edgar Morin. Uh, who talks about the complexity of the real uh, world in which we live today, a world that is uh, constantly uh, evolving in a, a productive and destructive loop. And uh, according to him, like part of this problem has to do with the diversity of the different people that we live in this world. And uh, so he proposes uh, as a, a way to approach this complexity, polycentric thoughts. And uh, for me, this has a lot of uh, uh, to see with games. I'm, I'm going to try to explain this during my uh, 15 minutes talk. Uh, but before going into uh, directly into the talk, I want to share with you a quote by my great grandmother. Mariana Frank, who was actually born in Hamburg, and so this is also why it is a, a, a big uh, honor for me to be in this festival. Uh, and she eventually moved to Mexico, and, and she used to say, like in, 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 in German, this is something like, Warum einfach, wenn es so schon kompliziert sein kann? That in English means something like, why to do things simply when it can be so delightfully uh, com uh, uh, complex. Uh, so, uh, uh, what, I, what I want to uh, share with you is like uh, this uh, approach that I've been using to study games uh, from uh, three different perspectives, uh, which uh, I would say in, in, in English that has to do with the ethical, poetical, and poetical. Uh, 
perspective on, on games. And I will uh, explain this a little bit further. So uh, th this first perspective that has to do with this ethic historical uh, side on games has to do with understanding uh, where do we come from and, what, and how can games be an evidence of this uh, evolution that as a, a humanity has gone through. But they, interestingly, it, is, it doesn't start with humans. We have seen games uh, also present in, in, in animals. And of course, I don't mean these kind of games, uh, neither these other games, but no, this uh, animal uh, play that has to do, that was, has been uh, studied by a, a lot of people and of course has uh, a lot of implications in terms of our way to socialize, to get ready to uh, adult life. Uh, but uh, as um, here we are talking about play, and I would also like to talk about games. So uh, what is interesting about games, and this is something that Apostolos Hispanos uh, wrote a book about it, that it's a very interesting book about the games of history. And what he says is that uh, games are, are an evidence of the material culture, and by studying games along history, we are able to understand the uh, cultures that play these games. So we can, I'm, I'm gonna, there are a lot of pictures in this presentation, so I'm gonna go like quite uh, fast through this. Uh, uh, and uh, we will, uh, we can reflect on the history of humanity by understanding the games that these cultures have played. And, example from like and i'm gonna try to pick also examples from different parts of the world so this is for example uh, a, a game that was used to play in uh, mexico let's say before a uh, colony and uh, but also in in in, in asia like for probably that's where uh, football uh, started or like the like the uh, the first evidence of a play with balls are in in this part of the world, like uh, in the year 600. And uh, for example, uh, quite an interesting uh, chapter of, of this book from uh, Spanos has to do with chess and understanding how chess has evolved from Persia, from India uh, into Europe, and now it's played everywhere. But it's interesting to, to think, like, why are we playing a game in which uh, the most powerful character is a woman, even though we live in a, a machist uh, society? And why are kings and bishops in the game when in traditional India there were not uh, these figures? So the games are also uh, uh, artifacts by, what, by which we can make a better questions about the history of humanity and uh, of course that we can also see a lot like a like a genealogy of games and for example we can track back the, like modern poker games into tarot which was invented uh, around the renaissance uh, and uh, about like all this uh, Art, it's also can be argumented that art is also some sort of game. This is a picture that uh, where we can see uh, like a lot of these games are still being played today, even though this uh, uh, painting was painted in the in 1500s. Uh, and for example, uh, also through understanding games, we can uh, have an idea of how people used to live and the wealth of the people that used to play these games. No? So, for example, here we can see a table, a German table for uh, spielen, for, for gaming, and uh, we can see here through the, the uh, details on the object uh, that this was probably from a wealthier family that had, had the opportunity to buy this piece of furniture, particularly for playing. Uh, and uh, yeah, let, let, getting into more, uh, more contemporary uh, games or uh, these tabletop games. This was the first uh, game in, uh, invented to and, and commercially uh, distributed 
And what is interesting, like, of course, this uh, picture uh, reminds us from this other picture that I showed you before. You know, this is the same structure of a circular uh, uh, pattern or the, like a yeah, path from the outside to the inside. And what is interesting about this game is that, is that it was originally designed to teach children about moral values of Christianity. So also the relationship of games with the uh, moral norms and uh, ethics. Uh, uh, and eventually, well, football and, uh, can tell us a lot of the cultures where they were played. And of course, also of the cultures of today's culture, we can do an analysis of today's culture based on how people are playing today. Uh, uh, and for example, we can also see how football, basketball, uh, even uh, baseball, they were invented to keep people entertained and doing sports. No, that's a way to activate people and keep them healthy. So the game, even though uh, most uh, people that will uh, say that games are uh, only uh, pleasurable in, the self, in themselves, it is also true that a lot of games are used for uh, another purpose. So, for example, for uh, keeping uh, the health or uh, for main ent 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 entertainment. Um, so, and we can also uh, understand games in a, in a global scale by understanding the, the politics of power that 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 are expressed through these sort of events and or for example uh, like we can ask questions about today's esports or the consumerism that is uh, tells us a lot about the cultures in we in which uh, we live today uh, so there are some uh, texts that might be interesting for people if they if you want to uh, continue learning uh, about this uh, historical perspective on games, but I will go to the next perspective that has to do with the poetic or participative, and it has to do with how games enable creativity. And for this, I'm going to use a lot of uh, diagrams uh, that are uh, uh, designed by a lot of people that on, uh, research about games. And uh, what is interesting is that from this perspective, we can understand games as systems because every system has pieces, has elements, and has relationship within the elements and have a, a, syst uh, a limit of the system. And well, uh, the games are basically systems. But what is interesting is we, if we see this, that they, these are pretty simple systems that can be visualized and uh, systematized within uh, iconical or this. Uh, engineering uh, visualizations. Uh, but the interesting thing about games have to do with, uh, for, with thinking of these games. Like when we think of games as, as the objects, they tend to be very simple. I mean, even chess that can be complex or can be difficult to learn, it's the, the, the rules are very simple. They can be written uh, in sentences. But what is interesting about it is that eventually, when games are are played, then uh, we have to start thinking in another perspective as complex complex systems. Because what it happens is that uh, when games are in play, we cannot uh, comprehend everything that's happening from the uh, from the strategy to the all the industry that generates people, uh, these games in, on play. And uh, for this section, I selected uh, some pic uh, pictures from my work, uh, from uh, previous uh, designs that I've done to promote uh, different ways of playing, uh, from children to uh, adults, uh, from the school to the street. And you would see how these um, well, most of these games, they were not only designed by me, but they were part of a participatory process. So I playing with the, 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 this, uh, with the students, with other teachers, we have come to uh, 
uh, understand the games also from a didactic perspective and understanding this dimension of, of, of participatory games. It's very interesting because the game here, it's not only the, the toy or the object, but it's the process by which we uh, create these environments of that allows to uh, create new stuff. And I'm trying to connect game with design, with arts, with creativity, and by designing games. No? So inviting uh, students to play and to reflect, uh, yeah, uh, make a reflection on their uh, games and, and try to play games from different perspectives and try to invent new ways of, of understanding uh, this, uh, uh, this process in which we are uh, coll collectively sharing ideas and collectively these ideas are taking shape and that's how games are designed by uh, testing them and understanding them and adding new ideas and changing the rules so that they can eventually be fun because I mean, the, the difference between a uh, um, uh, didactic material and the game is that uh, the games tend to be uh, fun and didactic material, it's not necessarily fun. So I'm also showing these pictures because eventually uh, we have been using this app called Miro, Miro to also design games. And uh, as you can see, this, the, these are some of the games that we have designed there. That is basically understanding how uh, this, uh, during the pandemics, how uh, the use of these uh, online platforms for, uh, that could be used uh, in order to create environments that they were uh, much more fun and not as heavy and as dull and as productive as traditional me uh, Zoom meetings and so on. So also I want to stress the a relationship or the dynamic relationship between games and play and how by playing games we can develop better versions of games. These are some of the texts that I would recommend you if you want to deep uh, digger into this scope. And I'm running out of time so I'm going to rush through the last, uh, this is very short, this poetic aesthetic and understanding uh, why do, do games matter, what is important about playing and what is the poetic and the aesthetics of game is something that is also being studied uh, by a lot of people that have that can be used for uh, getting us into the flow uh, channel or by different uh, uh, experiences of the different games that we tend to play uh, and the different uh, yeah, aesthetical uh, values on on, on play. Uh, but I would like to stress basically two. The first one has to do with collectivity. collectivity. So let's play to, to find other ways to interpret not only losing or winning, which I think is a very primitive uh, uh, emotion, but finding other ways to share what we do and inviting people also to play. So it's not only to play and to have fun ourselves, but sharing this fun with people around us. These are three books that explore this uh, in a more profound way. And uh, yeah, I'm in the last part of the presentation. So I just wanted to open this question for you and asking, why do you play? What is, what is your, uh, what do you want to take out of when you play? Is it only for fun or do you have other values such as co collective or uh, getting to know people or uh, forgetting your life at work, or any uh, experience that you ex experienced, it would be nice if you can share it in, the, in these last minutes. And uh, thank you very much for uh, this space. Uh, this is my email if you want to reach me. And uh, okay, that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Diego, uh, for this very, very interesting slides. And the question is for you, uh, dear audience and the people in, on Twitch. Um, yeah, how's about you? Why do you play? There's an answer. So we need a microphone for the audience here on stage. Uh, yes, 
so I have to explain why I'm playing. Uh, I, most of the time I just play to, to spend time, like to forget my daily life and to, to dr drive in a do new different context and a new different world, I would say. And I have, I have a question, I don't know, maybe you can answer it. You, you uh, say to us that uh, in the past that the games are, uh, were connected to values uh, or to specific uh, cultures. Uh, do you think this type of games is still existing in our modern society, that there are some games which are connected to a specific culture and maybe also represent some values? Or is everything so global and international so that there is no, n that there are no more the small things, I would say values and cultural things anymore because the games became so big and yeah, what do you think? It's a very good question. Very I would say, in, in, sorry, I'm so hard to think. Thank you very much. So, uh, what Apostolos would say is that every game has to be aligned with our values in order to play it. Every game, in every time in, in, in history. So, if you want to, if for you, Playing, it's a way to get out of your reality. It's because your values allows you to search for these uh, fantastic spaces or these uh, playful experiences in which you don't have to be thinking on your work, for example. And that's your value, and that's why you play. So if you're, but eventually, if by playing, you need to damage animals, for example, and maybe you would start, stop playing that because animals are, you value animals and hurting animals would be against your values. So you don't play anything that goes against your values. And this is a general question. But going into the details, I think, yes, we live in a very globalized uh, culture. So we can think that a lot of games are global because we live in a global society. But at the same time, I think it is interesting to, to search for local games. And I'm sure, for example, what's happening now at play. In Germany, there is a very particular community of play uh, game designers that has a particular uh, history and values. And that's why this festival happens in Germany and not in France, for example. I think France has a different value, set of values, and they would do other, uh, they would approach gaming in a different way. So I think there are subtle differences in different countries and in different cultures that they express themselves in different ways to play. Okay. Yeah. Thank, thanks for this answer. We also have a question from the Twitch channel, Diego. Um, does you, uh, do you, do you think uh, participatory game design is educational or can everybody be involved equally? I think that education has to be open to everybody. So when I'm talking about participatory game design from an academic perspective, it's not a traditional academy in which the process happens inside the room inside the university, inside school. We are trying to bring by this process uh, the play, play experience to the street so that everybody can be part of this uh, process because I think uh, education has to change. Education has come to a place in which uh, we don't want to be continue talking the same things. I mean, there are a lot of tutorials about how to do stuff that people, if people want to learn, they can go to YouTube or they can go to TikTok to learn new stuff. So uh, what I'm trying to, to do now is to, to try to understand what happens in the, these very complex spaces because gaming and playing is complex. You need to trust somebody to play with. 
So how and so understanding trust as a way to be able to have a, a play experience, it's something that you know, like it, it's a much more de de detailed process. That uh, so how do we learn to trust? How do we learn to collaborate? How do we learn to uh, to have like a healthy life? And, and this is something that, of course, the, the universities have to be involved, but not only academics. They, they, we have to, to, to work with uh, people uh, that are outside the university. And uh, so for me, I would say that this participatory process has to be open and uh, with people from the industry, from the neighbors, from the from. Uh, from the students, professors, and uh, professionals in general. Okay, uh, there's also an answer for your answer in the Twitch channel they, they've written down. Uh, thanks, that was quite inspiring. Uh, do you have any questions right now here from the audience? I think not so. I've got uh, one more question, one last question for you, Diego. Um, <coughs> In, in the German language, it's not so easy to to um, make the the difference between play and game. So we always say the same word for for gaming or playing. And you say you had this slide with um, this a kind of a diagram like rules follow system follows fun. And I just asked me, um, do we need more play in case of less rules? Like, is playing um, maybe, do we get more interaction with playing, not just with, with, with the games, with whole set of rules? Um, yeah, that's the question. <laughs> okay, so let me, let me phrase it this way. I would dare to say that every game, every play, every ex playful experience is defined by the rules. So the rule, I wouldn't like to think of the rules as something bad, but as a limit that allows the magic to happen. So let's think on football. So the rule in football is you cannot Touch the ball with your hands. Yeah. It's a very simple rule. But this rule allows for a, a lot of magic to happen. You know, we can see football, we can see world, world, world championships, we can play ourselves in, in any space. We only need a ball. No, so it's the most played uh, sport today because it's very simple. So when you get to, or, or this other example, you know, like game, games play of floor is lava. That's the rule. You cannot touch the floor because the floor is lava. So the rule, it, you know, it's contrary, counterintuitive because you think, okay, rules are are like are the enemy of fun. But I would say it's the other way around. No? So whenever we have like a nice rule that we want to behave through that rule, is that then we are start, we can start playing because we both understand the same rule as, as something that we share and we want to continue exploring within this rule. I mean, the thing is with what children do is whenever the, the rule is boring, we change the rule. You know, we, the rules don't have to be fixed and don't have to be bought, uh, top down. We can invent our own rules and why, why do, what do we want to play? And so me the question is how can we make collaboration fun because collaboration tends to be boring or hard or you know like but most of the things that we do in our daily life are by collaborating i mean doing a, a festival you need to collaborate with a lot of people and eventually when it is your job i can do, we do it more fun yeah, thank you. I think this is a, a good good sentence for the end. Just change rules and have fun. Just uh, keep your base rules respectful, playful, 
And yeah, and we are changing the rules uh, also right now. Uh, we make a break because the next slot is, uh, um, yeah, unfortunately not, uh, it's not, uh, they didn't come to the festival stage. So we make a break about 10 minutes and then we go on at 6.40 with the next uh, session also in English. So stay tuned on Twitch. Thank you very, very much, dear Diego. And yeah, uh, you can just uh, keep um, in, in the Discord channel and maybe there are some people from the audience or in the Play Valley who has some more questions for you. Thanks.